Welcome to Bloodroot Literary Magazine. I'm Doe Roberts. In April, we wrapped up celebrating Poetry Month, which was launched in 1996. And now we celebrate Short Story Month in May. Here to help us celebrate is Joni Cold, an outstanding author, editor, lecturer, and teacher. Joni is founder of the Writer's Center in White River Junction, Vermont. She leads writing workshops locally and at writing conferences and universities around the country. Joni is the author of Water Cooler Diaries, Women Across America Share That Day at Work, and her latest book, Toxic Feedback, Helping Writers Survive and thrive, and all writers certainly need help in surviving and thriving. And Joni is one of the super minds of the literary scene today to give us a helping hand. Welcome, Joni, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Joe. It's my pleasure. Joni, first tell us how Short Story Month got its start, and how's it doing? Well, let's hope it's doing well. It started after Poetry Month. I think they figured Poetry Month was a great idea, which it was, and so why not a month devoted to short stories? It's been around since 2007. I don't think it's as well known, but you start somewhere. I think it was started by the Emerging Writers Network, which I think you can find more information online about. And these were writers, editors, who had a great idea. Why not honor the short story? It certainly has fallen out of... Um, as much attention as some, uh, some other genres get. So what a great way to give it a little bit of boost. And, and people are picking up on it. There's more media press and there's more celebration of short stories. So what a good excuse to read more stories and write more short stories. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, share with us uh, some of the highlights essential to the craft of writing a short story. Yeah, a short story is a funny form because it's short, but as Henry Thoreau talks about, you know, while that's one qualification, it takes a long while to make a good short story. And it does. It's, it's an art to hide the art behind crafting something that appears so simple and yet isn't simple at all and resonates layer upon layer. You could define a short story in so many ways. The most traditional way is conflict, crisis, and resolution. You know, something is, is uh, making trouble. Somebody wants something that they can't get. And uh, the actions and the events of the story create more trouble until there's some kind of crisis, and then there's a resolution. That's a really traditional definition of a short story. James Joyce talks about how most short stories have what he calls uh, an epiphany, which is uh, where there's a shift in the mental landscape of the main character, and suddenly the events of the story allow the character to realize something that they didn't realize before. So that's a kind of lofty definition of a short story. But that said, there's all different forms and shapes and permutations a short story can take. And I like the definition best. Uh, a short story is when something happens to the reader. If you are affected by a short story, if it moves you, if it's this, this little earthquake you know, in your reading mentality, if it's memorable, I, I'd say that's a good sign. That's a good short story. It's certain. Yeah. What would you say is a good length? For How many words? Good uh, length. Well, that's a great question. Maybe 5,000 is really cutting it to the upper, upper, upper yeah. echelons of a short story, and, and then the form begins to perhaps drift a little. You might be getting more towards a novella. Uh, a 1,200 words, you can pack a ton of punch into 1,200 words. And now, of course, there's something called flash fiction. Yeah. And, you know, that could be 200 words and just knock your socks off. Now, is flash fiction and micro fiction the same thing? I don't know, actually. Well, some it might be. Yeah, I've been hearing the term microfiction, and I was a little confused if they yeah. meant flash. Yeah. The thing about a good short story, whether it's flash fiction in just a couple hundred words, or perhaps whether it's defined as microfiction, is it's not just a scene, though. A scene has its power, a power all unto itself, where things happen, things are shown rather than just told or commented on. But a story has to have that full effect. It has to, you have to feel like something happened to you, to the main character. So whether that happens in 150 or 200 words or, or as I said, 5,000 words, there has to be that completeness, that satiation that I think a short story is, is renowned for and why it is this, this powerhouse art form. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. That's, that's good. Wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, now, who are a few of your favorite short story oh. authors? I know there are many. <laughs> Pick out just a few and tell um, us uh, why you find them appealing. Grace Paley. I just love Grace Paley. 
she changed the form for so many writers. She made us understand we can write about our lives and discover the extraordinary moments in these ordinary, very ordinary uh, lifestyles, whether we're just sweeping out the house or waiting on a porch stoop uh, for someone to come home. I, I just love her. And um, John Updike. Uh, you know, classic. I love the story AMP. George Saunders, who's he used to always appear in The New Yorker, and he's become a novelist as well. I love the quirky humor in his pieces. Uh, uh, Frank O'Connor, Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, <laughs> even hearing these authors, you can see the form is broad, broad, oh, broad. Is, yes. And of course, I didn't even get to the names of the short story writers in my writers' workshops because we see a lot of them. Many of them have gone on to be published and. Their work is of the same caliber as Alice Munro and uh, some of these other literary luminaries that we hear about. So, mm -hmm. so I'm lucky I get to see behind the scenes these great short stories develop as well as appear in, in literary publications like Blood Root. So, uh, that must I'm be pretty exciting. Lucky. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exciting. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your advice for helping all of these unpublished authors know when or if they are yeah. ready for publication and how do they find the best place to publish their right. material? Uh, I, well, I always recommend workshops or working with somebody, a writing group, a critique group, maybe one-on-one -on -one with somebody mm -hmm. you know and love and trust. But you need, as a writer, to, of course, be writing. And I feel that also writers need to share their work. And I mean share it during the working stages to find out whether what they're saying is meaning and communicating to readers in the way that they intend. Feedback isn't intended to railroad your writing. It's intended to mm -hmm. allow you to say what you want to say with the most clarity. So make sure you get those stories read and critiqued and workshopped before you send them out. Um, because editors aren't going to work with you at this day and age too often. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, there, <laughs> no. are, there are lots of wonderful literary publications. Uh, many of them had gone online because of uh, financial necessity. But let's stay local here for a moment. Right here, the home offices of Bloodroot are, are right here. This is an awesome literary magazine. This is exactly the kind of prestigious publication as a short story writer you want your name to appear in. Um, you know, beyond that, you can look online. There's hosts of websites that talk about literary publications that are, again, both in print publications still or online. And then there's the traditional magazines. And the, the most important thing is the match. You want your voice to match the types of stories that appear in that publication. Um, you never want to compromise your voice, so you make sure that you keep your voice and, and match it to a publication that works. And you want to make sure you submit during the reading period. You write a query letter that's succinct but does list any other publications you have or any things of merit that you might want to share. Uh, and then you make sure to submit and resubmit and resubmit and resubmit <laughs> and go for quantity because at some point a quality story will find its home, but it becomes a numbers game at some point. And uh, so give it plenty of space for that story to find a home. Mm. And keep writing. <laughs> well said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a reality. Do, yeah, do you think it's a good idea to have a special time of day, a very specific time to call on the muse? <laughs> what a great question. No, I feel like people. Uh, one of the problems me, <laughs> so many writers, have is we, we treat the writing process as such a precious thing, when in fact we should write when we have 15 minutes to write. We should write in the car when we're waiting for our kid at soccer practice. We should write in the extra 10 minutes we have before we collapse at night. We should very much protect any big writing spaces that we have in the day, put our, our writing first. Um, most of the, the famous writers that I studied, particularly when I was reading Toxic Feedback and wanted to find out what's your writing process, so many of them, Ted Kuzer, poet, former poet laureate um, of the United States, got, gets up at four every morning, still gets up at four every morning to write. So you have to make it a priority. You have to know what your, your energy levels are during the time, certain times of the day, when's the best time to write. But this is modern life where parents or working full-time jobs so mostly just write when you have 15 minutes to write, or five minutes, or a half an hour, and really try to uh, demystify the process. You know, get those words down on the page. It's amazing the kind of quality you can produce in a 10-minute writing exercise. I've seen this for 15 years. Brilliant writing happening with a prompt at 10 or 12 minutes, and, and me saying go. <laughs> yeah. And so you know, writing, good writing happens at the oddest times. And I think good writers find that way. 
right. of doing it. Right. The, the, it, yeah, it was Picasso who said, inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. you got to sit there. you got to be ready gotta, for yeah. it. Yeah. Be trained. Well, thank you so much, Oh, sure. Jeremy. It's thank just you, a pleasure Del. to have you. Yeah, and congratulations on Bloodroot. I, I hope to submit myself. It's, oh, it's, great. It's, I love it. It's a great publication. Well, thank you so very much. Yeah, sure. Joni Cole. And now we turn to international author, teacher, and Bloodroot editor, Dolores Netsband. Dolores will read a short story from the 2010 edition, which I don't have to hold up because it's on the screen, uh, of a story by Jennifer Springfield titled Virginia State Map. Uh, Dolores Bloodroot has published a number of short stories since we started in 19... Oh, no, in 2007. Um, why did you select this particular story to read today? Well, I, st I chose um, uh, Jennifer Springsteen's story because I think it exemplifies what's best about the short story. I think uh, what Jennifer Springsteen did was she uh, distilled the best in language, well-crafted language, and imagery and put it all together to uh, give us the height of emotions and feelings as well as themes. That's why I chose her story. And there are a lot of feelings in this story. Oh, yes. I remember when we first read it for Bloodroot, we were all taken with this story. Yes, yes. Okay. very much so. Well, thank you. And will you now please read for us? Virginia State Map by Jennifer Springsteen. Inside their pockets, hands fell deep, fisted, split and red-knuckled, anger contained. A fine, thin line of inky black clotted under each round and rough nail, and the thumbs were calloused from flick, flick, flicking the lighter to start a new cigarette instead of a conversation. Inside their pockets fell the tiny flecks of Doritos and pimento cheese on white bread and packaged machine drop brownies. Pennies washed and dried clung in bundled threads like trap flies. Inside their pockets, the hands jumped and fumbled. When spoken to, feared the worst the hands sweat with the anticipation of it, but won't shake on it. Not yet. Not now. Not yet. The hands hardly came out, outstretched rarely, unraveled, to reveal the corded grooves, the thickness, the grip, the pinched veins and skin and nerves. Inside their pockets, the hands jumped and pecked at the legs. The hands hushed their faces. Her car swept into the gas station, past the pumps, and up to the open mouth of the garage where the men were playing cards just before. If she saw them tumbling out, she didn't look over. Instead, she held her hands flat on her face and rubbed up and down, up and down. She gave her head a shake and got out. I've got a dog here, she told them, and thumbed back at the car, a faded red escort with the front window cranked, front four windows cranked down. The two men stood staring at her, fidgety. Her white blouse was bloodied and short black hair stuck against her chest. Her nipples pricked in the cold, fading sun, in the long shadows thrown by the purple foothills. I didn't hit it, she said, but I saw him do it. In a pickup, she rammed her hands at her face, pushed at the eye sockets, and dug in her cheeks with the, thumb of her, with the thick of her thumbs. When she pulled them away, gathering her strength, she left blood smeared like a painted Indian. God damn it, y'all. It might have been funny to them at one time, but she scared them with the fit she wasn't having, but might any minute. And the crazy beauty of her, her rusty hair was slicked 
tight at her head, rolled past her bony shoulders. They noticed her sh short skirt, her clean white legs, her red clogs with open tops, and the crisp pink paint on the thin toes. The older man stepped forward and cocked his head at her car, craned to peek in the back seat. A dog, you say? He asked, placing the exposed hands on his thighs and rubbing a little to get the sweat off. Is it dead? It's not dead. It needs help. The girl looked up the quiet road and back down where she, she'd come the miles of dried wheat grass rolling on the stale Virginia breeze. The younger man took a step closer. In the back? Yes, the girl needed them to make it right. It was their country, their road, their dog hitting pickup. It was theirs to fix. She flung open the back door and bent in. She crooned. Her skirt was up high around the back of her thighs, not a single scar or dimple. They heard the whimper of the dog and then, shh, 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 now, shh. She flung her head back at them, standing still and mute like the gas pumps. Come over here. She scrambled across the floorboards, crouched behind the passenger seat and took the dog's head in her hands. The men moved up, bumped each other at the door, leaned their heads and wide shoulders and everywhere, flannel arms in. They filled the car with their tobacco breath. The dog began pumping its useless legs and chattering its teeth at the girl. It's a blue tick bit, said the older man. Think it's Sam's. Asked, Think it's Sam's, asked the younger. Could be, or Roger's but he's clear over in Locust Grove. Could have caught deer scent and wandered. You know how they do. The girl held the dog's head. Her knees ached where they pushed into the back seat. She watched the men. They had the same blue eyes, a little squinty, and the lower lids rose up like half moons. Their noses were thin and long with small flared nostrils, deep red crease lines on the older, fainter on the younger, circled down from the, from the nose to meet the sides of the wide puffy lipped mouths, sunburnt necks crowded into their buttoned and tucked flannel shirts. They weren't smiling types of men. They were eat whole meals without talking types of men. Not unkind, she thought, not purposely cruel. The dog looked at the girl's face and began to, sh and began to shake. Oh, she said, shit, said the younger. Is there a vet, the girl asked. Maybe we shouldn't move it. I'll get Pete on the phone, the older man said. He'll know what to do. How long will it take for him to get here? The, the younger men, men asked. The older lowered his chin, calculated. I'll get the shotgun, he said. No, the girl told him as he ducked out of the car and headed back into the garage. Call Pete. The younger climbed into the back of the car on the floor like the girl. He got his whole torso in and a knee. The other leg stuck out and balanced him where his face met the girl's and his hand beside her warm hip. The girl rubbed the top of the dog's blue fuzz head to quiet the chattering teeth. The girl and the younger were still. Then the dog's belly heaved and bucked. Its sides sucked in tight on the rib cage, the knobby spine until the belly blew out again like a big balloon. It's tongue, the girl said, it's tongue. It's the shock, said the younger. He lowered his voice for the dog. Hang on, old girl, hang on now. The girl's eyes were wide and the dog's eyes too, and the younger's knuckles grew white where they pushed, fisted, the wrist weakening. The dog pulled the skin from its teeth and snapped at the girl's hand. Then flack, blood flew from its throat,
and nose, landed like a round fist on the girl's turning cheek, a jerk and another jerk, and then the car was quiet again. The girl and the younger man were breathing heavily against the still of the car, steaming the back window, embarrassing one another with the sound of it, in and out, chest sucking, pulling, gathering up the life in the back of the car. When the older came stomping back, boots stomping and gun knocking at his thigh, he shoved his oil barrel chest into the small door's opening and sealed in the heat, the gathering air, the sweat ripened on the old man's face and under his chin, spun sticky webs across his neck with the dirt and oil there. The girl looked at her bloody chest, her hands buried under the dog's jowls. She tasted the rotten blood coughed onto her face and her lips, and she screamed. She screamed. Dad, it's over, the younger one said. Dad, my leg. He moved his arm down his thigh as if to pull it in, but the moving made the need to get out strong. Dad. The older stumbled back, cracked the back of his head on the roof of the car, cussed, and used the shotgun to balance himself. The younger vaulted out with arms and legs spread. He covered his knees with his hands and bent over with his whole head open to the late afternoon air. He gulped at it, the stick catching in the sick catching in his throat and writing itself again. Behind him, his dad said, Miss? With the shotgun propped against the car, he went in and pulled the girl out. Her bony knees tugged at the front of the seat. She released the dog's head and let it fall back, a muffled thump. The girl's legs had cramped and they weren't ready to support her when the old, older lowered her to the ground. She bounced like a puppet. The man pulled her up again and just for a moment, looking at his chest, the big safety of it, she wanted to wrap her legs on his hips, tuck her face in for a long cry, be his little girl. He would have let her too. But he woke her, saying, easy now. She unfolded her legs and steadied on the concrete. The younger took a hose and sprayed the back of the car. He used some thick soap and the foam spitting out across the deserted rows of gas pumps. The wind caught it, chased it along the blacktop. The older had taken the dog around the back in a heap of plastic. He covered the body and laid ro rocks to keep the plastic from flapping open, showing the whole thing over again. In the bathroom, the girl scrubbed at her bare chest with soap chips and brown paper towels. There was only, one, only cold water in there, not even a knob for the hot. She shoved her blood, bloody clothes into the garbage can and piled the paper towels on top, then pushed them down further. On the back of the toilet was the rain poncho the older man brought her. It was one of those emergency one-size-fits-all ponchos that came in a bag wrapped up small for a glove box. He bought her cheese nips and a Diet Coke, too. But she didn't want to eat in there. She didn't want to eat at all. The Coke might taste okay. When she heard the spray stop, she ventured outside again. The younger came out from under the hood of her car, and the older pumped gas in her tank. They watched her cross the lot in her big yellow poncho, wrinkled in squares from being folded so long. It came down to her shins. Her face was raw from the rubbing. Without her makeup, with her chapped cheeks, she could have been anyone's girl. Thank you, she said to them. You're all set, said the older. Okay, she said. She got into the car and saw the new Virginia State map on the passenger seat. Some water, a plastic wrapped tuna sandwich, more cheese nips. She smiled. They picked it out for her. 
She wanted to get out again, to thank them again, and maybe hug the older man, but she waited too long, and then it was awkward, so she started the car and drove away. She put her hand out and waved back at them. The air under the poncho gave her a little shiver. The men stood with their hands shoved in their pockets, inside the pockets where they could hide their longing for her, their desire to care for her. Inside their pockets, they fingered and pulled at the caught strings, worried the linted rosary. The hands were empty now, useless to them, two hard memories. They watched the red escort and her long, thin arm flagging from the window get sucked into the curb, into the evening shade. The older took one hand out, laid it on the younger's shoulder. Squeeze. Wow. Thank you for that moving, powerful reading. Dolores, you know, this Friday evening, the 21st of May, we're reading at Revolution right here in White River Junction. And we have six Bloodroot authors that it's going to read from our two uh, editions, the 2009 and the 2010 book. And Dolores and I will be there to cheer them on. Thank you so much, Dolores. Dolores Netsband, our earlier guest, was Joni Cole. Thank you for tuning in to the Bloodroot Literary Series. And as always, our thanks to CATV.